Good morning and welcome. Once again, we are coming to you live from our individual spaces as we gather as one collective community. We are Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist Congregation, and we are served by the Reverend Dr. Samantha Wilson. My name is Robin Balsell, and I'm a PA here at MVUU. We are a welcoming congregation, and I am honored to welcome you all, whoever you are and wherever you may be, to our service today. Today, we continue our special January adventure as we once again look at our history, honoring our past as we move into the future. Now we do this with an eye toward fully occupying our beautiful new building together as soon as it's safe. Last week, we heard from the Reverend Susan Manker Seal. Next week, we will hear from our most recently called minister, Reverend Ron Ferris. But this week, Rev. Joy Atkinson will return to share his thoughts with us. As we continue to take a look at ministerial relationships of the past, our goal is to heal wounds and find understanding by humanizing the ministry in our history, hopefully aiding us in creating space for our future. January remains an interesting and very potentially formative month in the spiritual life of this church. I am grateful to be here with all of you. And once again, welcome to all of you today. As we light our chalice, we will share words this morning from Elizabeth Mount. From our very first breath, we reach out. Co-regulation, not self-regulation, is in our nature. We find our cues from the sun and the moon. From each parent and caregiver, we find our place in this great turning planet by turning to one another, generation to generation. We awaken to the dawn and fall asleep at the evening's end. Our life's journey is part of something greater, something simple, something divine. A flame cannot be lit without a spark. A life cannot begin without the air. And we cannot begin to find ourselves without love. May we reach out to one another. May we offer love and nurturing care. May we join together in celebration of the interdependence of our lives. In this spirit, let us worship together. Keep your heart wide open Though the way want to push you around mm, you gotta keep your heart wide open till your faith brings you back to solid ground mm, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep my heart I'm gonna keep wide open I'm gonna keep my heart wide, wide open. open Though these waves wanna push Though they want me around Though the waves wanna push me around I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep my heart I'm gonna keep wide open I'm gonna keep my heart wide open Till my faith brings me back Brings me back to solid ground Until my faith brings me back to solid yes, ground we gotta keep We gotta keep our hearts We gotta keep our hearts We gotta keep our hearts wide open Though these waves wanna put us around Though these waves wanna put us around We gotta keep We gotta keep our hearts We gotta keep our Brings us back, brings us back, brings us back to solid ground. Say hi. Hi. 
We receive who we are before we choose who we will become. We are born into relationship before we shape relationships by our conscious intention. We inherit covenant before we create covenant. Covenant making must begin with the question, what have we been given? What is the covenant we are already in? What they dreamed be ours to do, we sang yesterday morning. It is important for us to remember this side of things, that we are first of all relational beings shaped by history, by a community of faith. Our exercise of free choice is in the context of relational existence. Words by Dr. Reverend Dr. Parker. Hey, hi, Reverend Hello. Joy. It, this is our first time actually seeing each other's face. Yes, indeed. Yeah, good it's, to see you. So how are you? I'm doing really fine. Um, I've been thinking about my time in uh, Tucson and I realize it's been almost a decade since I left, nine mm -hmm. and a half years. Um, and since then I've served six more years as an interim minister in four different congregations. Um, and then three and a half years ago, after 41 years in both settled and then interim ministry, I uh, finally retired. So I am now retired happily. What else do you remember about your time in Tucson when, when you were with Mountain Vista? Well, um, one of the things I did I, in preparation to be talking with you, I um, picked out the, the file that I, I keep files on each congregation. See, they come in handy. Uh, is that oh, no. paper? Can you touch, <laughs> can you touch it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actual paper. I have things online too, but I just looked at the paper stuff and it, it consists of sermons and uh, reports that I made to the congregation and write-ups of different uh, group activities that we did, all of, all of these interim um, specialty kinds of things. But before I even <coughs> opened this file, I just stop, stopped to think what was, you know, because I've done 11 different interim ministries, and I asked myself what was unique, what really stands out about my being in Tucson? And two different things came to mind. Um, one was the uh, terrible time of the shooting, mass shooting, um, and it's interesting, I just saw on PBS the uh, um, the memorial that has just been, I guess, finished about that terrible thing, where six people died and Gabby Giffords, uh, Congresswoman, was, was shot um, and could never work, couldn't really work again after that. And uh, other people were, were wounded. And one of the members of the congregation was stuck in this mall where that happened and couldn't get out for several hours, I think. Uh, but it was it was and made an impact on everybody in the community and certainly on the congregation and um, the next day was sunday so we all came like shell-shocked to the service and uh, there was a lot of time for the the uh, expression of of shock and and uh, sorrow and a lot of tears and lots of sharing uh, which we needed, we really needed. Um, I did have a sermon title that I had come up with before the, the shooting happened. Ironically, the sermon title was Civility and Graciousness. And uh, I actually revised the sermon based on what had happened, but it was still relevant uh, mm -hmm. given that awful experience of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, a mass shooting right there, you know, blocks from where most of us were. Um, so that really stuck in my memory and I'll always remember that. Um, the other unique thing that I thought of was the experience of creating a prison ministry with the congregation. So um, I had received a letter from an inmate in the Eloy Correctional Facility and he had started a small group um, of inmates and he wrote 
asking about creating a relationship with a UU congregation, and we were the closest one. So after reading that letter, I decided, why not? This is an outreach. This is an expression of um, creative, ongoing uh, love. And uh, I asked people, would you like to join me in doing something with these inmates that are identifying as you, you in that um, facility. And to my delight over something between 20 and 25 people hmm. came forward and said, yes, we'd like to do this. And uh, that many people got trained by the prison staff. And uh, we began to visit with the inmates and we'd do a little service with them and they would do some of what they did in their small group with us present. Um, they did a lot of deep sharing. It was very, very powerful. And um, we brought them hymnals that were donated um, by the congregation and we brought them paints. One of them was an amazing, well, more than one of them were, were amazing artists. And we listened to their writing and one of the members coached them in writing who was also a writer himself. So it was a wonderful back and forth interaction. Even got written up a little, in, uh, this was after I left, uh, but uh, I was called to interview with some somebody on the staff of the UU World to write up something about this prison ministry. And I don't know exactly how long it lasted, but it was unique in my experience. I had never had the opportunity to do anything like this and I was just gratified by the congregation's very positive response to it. Mm -hmm. um, so both of these events, as I was thinking about it, the, the mass shooting and the prison ministry um, speak to the theme of today's service, which as you have told me is courageous love. Mm -hmm. um, one of the core values you aspire to and to my way of thinking, those two events were expressions of courageous love. There was an outpouring of love and support for the victims of the shooting, as well as love and support for one another in facing this kind of a tragedy. And the courageous love was very much evident in our work in the prison ministry. Going through, you know, all the hurdles you go through to get inside a prison, all the thick walls and the gates and everything and being accompanied. Um, in order to speak with inmates who were hungering for a UU connection. So to me, that's cre creative, courageous love in action. Um, I also have to say, I found that love very much alive in the congregation itself in their relationships with one another. Um, one of the smaller projects we worked on was revising the behavioral covenant statement um, among members to make it more um, concise because it was a rather wordy um, and user friendly. And I was thrilled to, to go to your website and see that it's still up there, that you still use that very concise statement of how we want to be with one another, that kind of a covenant. Um, and to me, that was an expression of love and uh, concern for one another and concern for how you communicate with one another. Um, I, uh, in one of the small groups, I um, asked a, the question about what do, you, what do you all like about this congregation? And I want to quote from my own report. One person said, no, many people said, um, among the things you like about this congregation, you mentioned acceptance and an open atmosphere, friendliness, fellowship, love, warmth, diversity, joyful, nice, like-minded people, and feels like family. Those are the <laughs> things that I wrote in the report that summed up what people said. And uh, to me, that was an expression of creative, uh, I keep saying creative, courageous love. Uh, in action. Uh -huh. So that, uh, that was impressive to me and, and working together on the behavioral covenant and getting it down to a few words that are very poignant, I think. 
So then that was that was some of the the joyfulness were what were the things that Mountain Vista were going through then? Um, what were some of the growing edges? Well, I, the main things, the two most pressing issues that were present when I, when I came to the congregation, um, and I arrived in the fall of 2010. So um, it was a time when the economy was tanking somewhat. <laughs> Um, but the two most pressing issues that are interrelated were building issues and finances. <laughs> Very much what <laughs> some of what you're going through now, yep. um, but in a very different way now. Um, pledges were la lagging in the congregation and um, they had to pass a deficit budget for several years before I got there. Every year they passed a deficit budget, they, they drew down um, their uh, meager reserve funds or uh, endowment funds. Um, and I, I saw that this, and they knew, of course, that this is unsustainable in the long run. So I remember speaking to the congregation about some of the reasons I saw for pledging being down, like the economy, and the fact that there were a lot of retired people who um, are, were on fixed incomes. And the other factor was the the snowbird phenomenon that I had never come across anywhere else um, where uh, people would divide their pledge what would be a nice healthy one pledge to one congregation but they divided it between two congregations so each congregation got somewhat less and uh, and that was a challenge because it was a fair percentage 13 percent in one survey that I saw of the congregation um, so uh, that was an issue, and there were reasons for pledges being lower, but I thought that uh, this congregation could do a lot better, mm -hmm. and a lot of people agreed with me, a lot of the leadership agreed, um, that we needed to bring up the average pledge to, to be more in line with what the UUA was recommending and, and what other congregations were able to do, not all of them, of course. But um, so we launched two pledge drives, two regular pledge drives, but we were ambitious in, in um, uh, trying to get the pledge level up. Um, I said at the time, I remember that there felt like there was a culture of scarcity and a lot of anxiety around finances um, and that that needed to be acknowledged and addressed. So we mounted the pledge drives each year and um, worked really hard on getting the pledges up and they did go up somewhat. And the congregation had finally a balanced budget, but there was a cost and the cost was, it was decided that it's more sustainable to go for a three quarter time minister. So that was done and there were, a lot of people were disappointed that that had to be done but it was done and there were still as i recall three good candidates mm -hmm. even at that level of of uh, salary uh and then of course uh, the congregation chose ron fairs and he came understanding uh we he and i had talked about it he came understanding that there was a culture of scarcity and um said that he wanted to work on that further so Mm -hmm. But that that was an ongoing. That's part of the DNA too, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, anxiety around finances and and the scarcity mentality mm -hmm. that you know it's a it's a challenge, but it's um, something that can be dealt with. I think over time. And you've been a minister in a lot of different contexts. What do you think helps when folks are feeling scared about scarcity, especially around finances? What supports people in, in moving through that together? You know, I think if there's kind of a group think that can happen when people begin to raise their pledges and talk about it mm -hmm. and, and, and tell other people, you know, I realized I could do without this and I did it. I do without this other thing because this congregation is so valuable and so important to me that I want to support it to the best of my ability. And it catches on and mm -hmm. people begin to see we don't have to think in terms of scarcity. We can think in terms of abundance. Mm -hmm. And we may not ever get to, you know, abundance in, in the sense we'd love, where we can just spend and spend, you know, but just the fact that people acknowledge 
you know, we were we were thinking of, you know, we have to cut this and we have to cut that. Why don't we think in a different way? Mm -hmm. And it, it it takes a few to to start that ball rolling, but then it can catch on and it can be very successful. Mm -hmm. We did some of that. We had a ways to go still by the time I left. Well, it, it makes me just think that that happened. And then they also launched a huge capital campaign where there was a, I mean, talk about abundance. Yeah. yeah. Just that moved right into actually we have enough even to give more. So mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Right. So um, the other issue, of course, was the building. At the time I was there, the congregation was still in the triple wide on the hill, mm -hmm. which was an amazing thing. So anyway, the congregation had uh, engaged architects years prior with big plans to uh, build a whole new sanctuary and new buildings for RE on the property. It was a grand plan. Um, but the funding just wasn't there to do that. So the plans were scaled down to make do but improve what was there. Um, they were scaled down greatly. But then to add to that disappointment, even the modified plans were stalled. They couldn't do anything mm -hmm. because of permit issues. It was a strange thing. that They didn't have a proper certificate of occupancy for the building to begin with they've discovered and they had to struggle with with uh, the uh, governmental powers that be on that issue. So given that the, there was a stall in terms of any progress on the building. And um, I was just thrilled and delighted to see that you guys have, you know, gotten a new building and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I watched the uh, video and I was just so impressed, given what I remember about the building issues being, you know, so difficult, almost insurmountable, it seemed. Um, now, I understand there are still financial challenges around um, the building mm -hmm. regarding renovation costs and all, but I think this congregation is, be, is to be congratulated for finally having um, an aesthetic and functional home oh. but it is it is quite impressive that was an amazing accomplishment just amazing mm -hmm. so despite the serious challenges of building issues and finance and they're very basic issues um i still discovered a congregation that was really very warm and welcoming mm -hmm. i mean when a congregation is going through lots of conflict um that takes center stage and even eclipses other issues but here the congregation was getting along um being warm and welcoming getting new members in but you know so they didn't have to work on that front and really when you think of what a congregation is about it's best to have that and then have to deal with some of the financial and building and other you know practical issues than to have to change the whole mindset of a congregation where they're at each other's throats and not getting along too well. So um, it was very wonderful to walk into that kind of feeling in that con in the congregation and uh, have the support that I got myself for all the, you know, the various, I threw on them a lot of extra meetings and events, you know, all in pursuit of interim goals and uh, mm. event developmental uh, issues. There's something I wanted to be sure and say about this aspect of courageous love in action. Um, one member in one of the small groups I led when I asked people to envision the congregation 10 years into the future, which is now, um, <laughs> one person summed up the gratitude this person felt for the active leadership at the time by saying, 10 years from now, we will look back on the current leadership and thank them for getting us to this place. Hmm. And that just really struck me because it's that time now, 10 years from then, and look where you are. I mean, it's way ahead of where you were as a congregation um, when you were up on that hill, stuck, not being able to move forward with building plans. And there had to be finance, financial work to get to where you are, as well as 
um, you know, finding a, a building that was adequate. Mm-hmm. So it's, mm-hmm. it's quite thrilling. <laughs> oh, joy. Thank you. You're welcome. You're Thanks welcome. for Thanks for coming back. I, I really appreciate it. It's good to hear you and hear, hear the past and the present and the present and the past and your wisdom. Thank you. You're very welcome. It was a delight. <laughs>Good morning. Love is a powerful word. It conveys so much more than four letters can can actually hold. When I had a choice as a small child to memorize a Bible verse, I chose God is love. I looked it up this week and the verse is much longer than that, but I remember those three words still. And what they said to me didn't help me understand what the word God meant. It didn't tell me anything about the real existence of God or non-existence of God, but it confirmed how I felt about humanity and my purpose in life. I knew and experienced love daily in my family. I feel really fortunate that I was aware of how my parents, my extended family, my neighbors and my teachers valued me and cared for me. And I saw those same people value and care for their neighbors, others in the community and people that they never ever knew. I saw them organize charity events, donate, to fund drives, volunteer for outreach efforts, and engage politically. In my family's home, strangers were invited in to stay with us as they dealt with issues of life. My family expanded and reshaped each time we shared our shelter and other resources. Living this example of love in action is what I have found to be the most satisfying, meaningful, and sustaining way to live. My husband and I worked for many years with an organization whose motto was Veterans Helping Veterans. Our interaction with military families dealing with mental health issues, addiction, disability, or poverty, 
actually strengthened our own marriage. And it helped us as we faced our struggles. When we migrated to the Unitarian Universalist Church at a stressful time in our lives, it was a haven for us to return to our core selves. We were loved by that congregation and were again able to receive and give love. Thomas Merton wrote, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That is not our business. And in fact, it is nobody's business. What we are asked to do is to love. And this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy, if anything can. Bob and I have been married for 43 years. And I can tell you that love as a personal practice is meaningful and transformational for the individuals involved. Love as our united congregational practice will be transformative and meaningful for who knows how many individuals, families, classrooms, and neighborhoods. That is why when I was on the church board and we were spending many hours discussing our mission vision statement, including the word love meant enough that I got a bit forceful about it. Reverend Sam reminded me of that meeting and how I spoke up. I remember that I wasn't feeling real loving at the moment. I was tired of the many hours on Zoom. I was frustrated with the length of time we played word salad ping pong, debating what it should say and how it should say it. I couldn't keep up the quiet group participant role. I wanted action. So I snapped and I said, what we're talking about is not the purpose of church. Reverend Sam asked me what I thought the purpose of church is. And I didn't have an answer, but my gut reaction was to say, love. It's not a noun, it's a verb. Church is about taking action. It's about doing, not just discussing. It's about making change happen, not just hoping and praying for change. Thankfully, the others agreed. We completed our statement. And now it's time for us through love, with love, to muster all the action we can.
I um I feel so much tenderness when I uh, listen to Reverend Joy and Robin, um and Reverend Ann bowling, <laughs> almost like with tears in my own eyes too. Um, kind of floated along by Chris. Uh, this just sweet feeling of how many people have loved this congregation for so long and the um poignant the poignancy of reverend joy who's with us today um having been with you 10 years 10 years ago and asking you what what on earth could be possible in 10 years and this incredible lack of knowing uh, and yet that we risk going forward together is miraculous it's miraculous. And so I'm sitting this month with previous ministers, but also new visions. And your new vision is encompassed in these three values that your previous board worked very hard on, um, with Anne being there, of course, and that you all worked hard on. Over 70 of you participated in the process of saying, what is at the center of this community? And so last week you said that one thing that is at the center of this community is open hearted engagement. And this week we're saying that one of the other things at the center of this community is a courageous kind of love. Now, I imagine for some of you hearing the word love um, brings up a lot of different feelings. And uh, there's there's camps around that word for some of us. We have a lot of different backpacks. If you think of that word kind of having a backpack of all the things that get stuffed into it while you're moving through your life, the different cultural messages, familial messages, community messages you get about what love is. And each of us is like carrying a kind of backpack. And there's a few things in there that might be similar and a whole lot that probably looks very different. But here we have a, a value that we think we share. And it's not new that we think we share this value. In fact, there was a study done in 1976, um, and that 1976 is 15 years after the merger of our Unitarian and Universalist tradition to form Unitarian Universalism, something entirely new. And that, that bit of research is still in motion today. We are currently in the process of what is called the Article II Commission, and that is our commitment as Unitarian Universalists to revisit our covenant and our principles on a regular basis, to ask ourselves what is at the center and is something new emerging that we need to be listening to. And as a liberal tradition, we mean liberal as in on the horizon change is coming, and instead of fighting it back, we kind of sit in open hearted engagement posture and we look to the horizon to say, what's coming before us? And when this commission got started, it had a very unique charge and it's happening right now. A rewrite of our principles is happening right now. And that commission was told that at the center of the rewrite needs to be love. If you look through our principles currently, you will not find the word love. And yet the word love, the feeling of what we think love might be, moves through each of those principles quite obviously. And yet what would it be like if it was the organizing principle of our choosing to come together? Now, they said the word love because of this 1976 bit of research by Robert Miller from Tufts University. And what Robert Miller used was a kind of value ranking system. His question was, is there a kind of unique value system to the kinds of people who call themselves Unitarian Universalist? And he compared how Unitarian Universalists uh, rank their values in comparison to folks who identified as Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant. And he was curious across those different traditions and across economic class and socioeconomic status, did the values change? And so he had two sets of values, one, one that he called instrumental. So the kinds of things that get you somewhere, the values that tell you, oh, this is how I do something, the practice of something, I think is what Anne said, the practice of love. 
And then he had a list of terminal values, terminal meaning where you think you're going with that. So I'm practicing loving and I think that's going to get me to X, Y, or Z. And he sent these little booklets out to a representative sample of UUs across the United States, including ministers and religious educators. And inside that little booklet, he had like um, these little labels that you'd have to peel off of these values. And then he had a little area where you were supposed to reorganize them based on your ranking. And then you sent it back and, and waited for results uh, from the community. And what happened was very interesting. The first thing that's interesting is that one of the values, a terminal value, meaning where you think you're going, was salvation. And the, the funny thing they write in their little 1976 study is that you use clearly do not value salvation. When they looked at the paper, some of the people took salvation and like stuck it in the corner and other people turned it upside down and people ripped it and, and put it in the corner and some people just refused to put it on there altogether. And so clearly, as he writes, you use have a non-value of salvation, which maybe some of you are laughing at or enjoying the, the, the minor acts of research resistance that you use were saying about salvation is not our thing. And that might make sense. But there are a few things that were our thing. And Lee is actually going to go ahead and show you what the outcomes of that were. The values that you used said at the time were where they thought they were going, self-respect, wisdom, inner harmony, a mature love, a world of beauty, and an exciting life. And the way they thought they'd get there, the instrumental values, is by loving, by being independent, intellectual, imaginative, and logical. Now you might have a lot of your own interesting um, analysis of what this list looks like, what this 1976 snapshot of Unitarian Universalist says to you. But one thing you will notice at the top, and what's unique about this is that this was higher than any other religion that they studied, is that you use valued loving as a primary instrumental value. Unlike any other of the three religious traditions who valued things differently, loving was at the center of that being. And you can see that in the terminal values, there's another love there, a mature love. What is it that mature love looks like? I think about Anne and Bob's 40 something year marriage. What, what is required of a mature love? Now, there's things that did not make the list that I think are interesting to who we are now. One is forgiveness and forgiving. The value they didn't get ranked in Unitarian Universalism was forgiving. It was in the instrumental way. So the values you use to get where you're going. And they were puzzled by this, the researchers that did this study on Unitarian Universalists. How can a tradition that values love so deeply not value the process of forgiving people? And they thought it was because we don't do the salvation thing. So if there's nothing that needs to be saved, then maybe there's nothing to be forgiven. But they made one comment about that that it probably is hard for Unitarian Universalists interpersonally to value so much independence and yet crave so much love and to wonder about the gap between those two. Now, the value that we're saying today, now, 2021, is the courageous love. And courage, to me, suggests a kind of risk. And I think the risk is in the things that uh, Anne and even Reverend Joy suggested. The pain that comes in community when you are not independent, when things are not quite logical or intellectual, when there is hardship and suffering, what is it that you actually need? And love, a mature love, requires some kind of relationship to disappointment and pain and change 
and endings. Not just that people might cause us pain, but the reality that I cause pain. And what heals the wound of causing pain in a mature kind of love? But perhaps forgiveness, attending, leaning in to what might not feel worthy, easy, pleasurable, exciting, or beautiful, or harmonious, but still worthy. What a risk we take indeed. So what is it that we offer each other now, knowing we are a people who love a good intellectual imagination and who like a little independence? What is it that the world needs of us that we practice when we come together? What kind of loving do we need now? Today, just like last week, we're sending you into the pew. Imagine that you are seated together in a congregation. Imagine you're physically close to someone. And imagine that from the front of the room, I just said, you are going to turn to your neighbor and share one thing that's on the top of your heart. One thing that might say something about the kind of love needed now. And your neighbor might not want to participate. They might not turn and face you, or they might tell you they have nothing to share, or they might pass. They might be in a moment of meditation or prayer. They might not have their microphone on. They might not have a camera on. That's perfectly fine. Offer a, a tending of love to the name you see on your screen. You're welcome to come back to the main room where Chris will be playing music, and we'll see you when you get back. May you be changed by Emily Richards. May you leave this time together changed. May the promises you have made to yourself about who you want to be feel closer to the reality of who you are right now. May you share that feeling of transformation wherever you go. May it spread 
into every word, deed, thought, and interaction until we are all changed, transformed, and transforming together, becoming our better selves. We extinguish this chalice today, but we are illuminated by a faith that allows us to sit and think. In this quiet time, we can reflect in solitude, meditating on love and growing out of our comfort. Though we experience discomfort, we are excited to give birth to a new, just world. <laughs>